Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Laura, for having me. I'm so excited and honored to be here to share some of my research with you. Um, she sort of summed it up, though. Diets don't work. It's terrible for you. But I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on that. And I think uh, the reason why this is so important is because dieting is one of the best known uh, serious risk factors for eating disorders. Uh, and so my goal today is to try and offer you some research findings that you could take to your clients or use in your own recovery journey or use with your friends and family to understand, A, that dieting doesn't work. It might even be a little bit dangerous in terms of its risk for eating disorder, pathology, uh, and maybe understand a little bit about why dieting doesn't work. So I want to start by giving us sort of a sense of the scope of dieting. So we know from nationally representative data from this thing called the NHANES study that millions of people are dieting at any given time. And most of those people are cutting calories in order to lose that weight. And what's more, talking about the medical establishment, if uh, your doctor perceives that you've gained weight or that you need to lose weight, the first thing that they recommend is dieting. So it's the first line treatment for obesity. Uh, and so what I want to start with today is by making sure to clarify that when I say dieting today, I don't mean intuitive eating. You know, I don't mean eating more fruits and vegetables. I really mean restrictive dieting where you're severely cutting your calorie content in order to lose weight. And so this is really the first paper uh, that my advisor, Tracy Mann, and I published, taking aim at the medical field. But I'd like to give you a little bit of back story on this paper. So before I even started graduate school, I was auditing a class that Tracy was teaching called The Psychology of Eating. And in it, we read diet study after diet study after diet study where people did lose weight in the first three to six months of their diet, but that weight would come right back. And after we read enough of these studies, we were like, what is going on? Does dieting even work? Has anyone systematically really evaluated the science on this? Uh, and so that's what we set out to do. And I think the key here with, with this paper is that we decided to look at long-term outcomes of dieting. Because if you lose weight and then gain it right back, that's not, to me, what you would consider a successful diet. So we looked at all the studies out there that had at least a two-year follow-up uh, after the diet in question. And so when you set that strict criterion, there aren't that many studies. So we found first 13 studies without control groups. So that means you put everyone in the study on a diet and then see what happens to their weight. And so you can see here that the initial weight loss was pretty dramatic. This is why people think dieting works, I think, 40 pounds of initial weight loss. But what we also found is that over time, the ultimate gain back was 32 pounds, so a net of seven pounds of weight loss. But I think the more alarming figure here is that a third to two thirds of study participants actually gained back more weight than they initially lost on the diet. And so they're sort of worse off for having started on this diet. So I think this is alarming. But whenever we present this kind of data, people say, well, you know, if they hadn't gone on the diet, then their weight would have totally ballooned. So at least, you know, we're, we're saving them from that inevitable huge weight gain. And so that is what a control group is designed to test. If you didn't go on the diet, what would have happened to your weight? And so that's why we call this sort of the blue ribbon standard of dieting, what we call randomized controlled trials with a control group, where you put, where you randomly assign one group to diet and then the other group doesn't diet, to really get at this question, if you hadn't dieted, would your weight have gone crazy? And what we find is that in the average, in the diet group, the average weight change is a loss of about 2.3 pounds. And the control group did not gain incre incredible amounts of weight. They gained 1.3 pounds. And in fact, this difference is not statistically significant. And so we sort of concluded from this that dieting doesn't work for long-term weight loss. Seems The evidence seems pretty clear. But oh my goodness, we got tons of pushback, especially from the medical community. When we tried to publish this paper, the editor-in-chief said, we're having problems finding reviewers for your paper. So it's not like they're reviewing it and saying it's not good. No one will even touch this thing. And so what had to happen is 
he said, I'm going to invite an opposing piece, and I'm going to write a bridging editorial, sort of reconciling all of this. And it was only with this sort of divine intervention of the editor-in-chief that this paper ever even saw the light of day. So clearly, this is a message that you know, the medical community really doesn't want to hear. And then I sort of made it even worse a couple later, a couple years later with this paper. So we decided now that it had been a couple years, let's go back into the literature and see uh, once again, does dieting work? But this time we decided to take it one step further and actually ask, is dieting related to health? So is the amount of weight you lose on the diet actually related to things we want to see, like lowering blood pressure, lowering blood glucose, lowering cholesterol, blood fats, things like that. So I'm going to show you a graph that's slightly scary, but I will walk, walk you all through it. OK. So here on the x-axis is a uh, amount of weight change uh, from zero all the way up to nine. This is in kilograms. So, and on the y-axis here is blood pressure. Uh, but all of the outcomes we looked at, whether it's blood pressure, blood glucose, triglycerides, all the patterns of the findings were the same. So the first thing I want to know is just look at this y-axis number of kilograms lost. If dieting is super effective, we should see all the dots of the studies clustered over to the right, right? We should see lots and lots of studies that have many, many kilograms of weight lost over the long term. And we don't see that. We see maybe two over here, a couple here, but really they're clustered down here in the zero to two kilogram weight loss uh, range. So I think that's sort of the first take home message of this, that not a lot of weight loss is maintained. So once again, we're finding that dieting doesn't seem to work in terms of weight loss. The other thing is, now we're gonna look at blood pressure here. If there's a super strong relationship between the amount of weight you lose and the uh, drop in blood pressure that you see, all you should see a really strong negative diagonal line here. And you don't really see that. So, there isn't really like a strong relationship at all between the amount of weight you lose and your blood pressure. So it seems like even if you do go on a diet, even if you are able to lose weight, it's not really linking up with improvements in health. And isn't that what this is all about? And the last thing I'll say is this was true no matter how high quality the study. So the uh, triangles versus the dots. So. Um, Let's see. So, okay, the, however big the shape is, that's how many, uh, that's how big the study sample was. So the bigger the shape, the more participants. You know, larger studies tend to be more reliable. So it doesn't seem like if your study's bigger or smaller really makes a difference either way. Uh, the other thing is the darkness or lightness of the shape. That is talking about how many participants dropped out of the study. You don't want to see a lot of dropouts in the study. That means it's not a very strong study. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. No matter how strong the study, no matter how many participants in the study, we're just not seeing weight change relating to uh, health outcomes. And in fact, you can see the correlation coefficients here are not statistically significant. So why are we even doing this? That was my sort of take home <laughs> message from this paper. And so I wanna take a tiny segue into the policy implications of this. And so if losing weight isn't related to health, then why are we so terrified and up in arms about having a high body mass index or BMI? And it's not just a matter of society being worried about this. This is about to be codified into law. So the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, has proposed a ruling saying, and saying that it will soon be permissible for companies to use body mass index, BMI, as a criterion for how much you charge your employees for the health insurance. With the thought being, if your BMI is 30 or above, so if you are in that so-called obese range of BMI, then you are able to charge those people up to 30% more for their health insurance. And so, to me, this seemed like a bad idea uh, because there's no way that every single person whose BMI is 30 or above 
is unhealthy. And if they're not unhealthy, but you're charging them more for health insurance, that's really an unfair situation. And so in this next study I'm gonna to talk to you about, we looked at nationally representative data and looked at, you know, are you really unhealthy if your BMI is 30 or above? What about if your BMI is in the underweight region? That's something we don't talk about a lot, but that is really relevant here um, in terms of eating disorders. So, if we're trying to make the argument that your BMI can be 30 or higher, but you can still be healthy, you need to make sure, we needed to make sure that our definition of healthy was really strict. We didn't, we wanted to make sure that the people we're calling healthy were actually very healthy across every single system of their body. And so we had a very stringent definition of cardiometabolic health. So their blood pressure had to be uh, good. Their blood uh, fats needed to be good. HDL, high density lipoprotein, that's the good cholesterol. You had to have lots of good cholesterol. Your fasting glucose had to be low and no insulin resistance. And then C-reactive protein is a uh, marker of risk for cardiovascular disease. So you couldn't have high C-reactive protein. So if you fit all of these criteria, then we called you healthy. So it's a really conservative sort of definition. And so this is what we found. Uh, the numbers here are pretty small, but I just want to first draw your attention to uh, these uh, overweight obesity, obesity type two and three. So those are the people's BMIs at the very, very high end of the range. And we found that almost 54 Americans uh, in this overweight or obese region would be mistakenly classified as unhealthy if this EEO, EEOC rating goes, ruling goes through. And I think most relevant to us here, almost a quarter of underweight people are unhealthy. These are the people who sort of uh, get a free pass because we look at them and they look healthy to us because they don't seem to be overweight or obese. Uh, but I think this paper, and this is a point that didn't really get picked up in the media coverage of this paper, but you know, just because somebody is, is uh, underweight, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthy. And so if we're gonna use BMI as our criterion for who's healthy or not, we're gonna end up misclassifying 75 million Americans. 75 million Americans will either be unfairly uh, charged more for their health insurance or should be charged more because they're unhealthy but actually aren't. They'll be sliding under the radar. And so that's the end of my detour. So let me get back to this idea that dieting, low calorie dieting, just doesn't seem to work in terms of weight loss over the long term, in terms of health across all the systems of your body. And so now I'm going to go a little bit into why. Why doesn't dieting work? And I was trained uh, as a, a health psychologist at UCLA, and we are really strong in stress research. And so I started thinking about dieting in terms of stress and you know, Oprah's out there saying, oh, dieting doesn't work, all it does is stress you out. And I'm like, yes, yes, that's totally true. And if that's true, then it has sort of a uh, scary implication here. And let me tell you why. What's the problem here? Well, just a tiny bit of biology. When your body perceives a stressor, it's not just your mind that starts freaking out. Your body starts triggering a physiological process that ultimately ends up in something called cortisol, the stress hormone cortisol, you may have heard of it. So when you uh, experience a stressor, your hypothalamus lights up and then that sends a signal to your pituitary and that sends a signal through the blood to your adrenal glands which sit right on top of your kidneys and that uh, secretes cortisol. And so that's called the HPA axis. And so the question is, what does cortisol do to your body? Well, uh, cortisol is great in our sort of ancestral times when the kind of stress that we encountered was a physical threat, so a woolly mammoth chasing you. Because what cortisol does is it tells your body to uh, flood your body with glucose so that that can go into your muscle beds so you can run away faster. 
Uh, but the problem is in our modern day and age, most of the stress that we encounter is psychological. So we're just sitting there in our bedroom feeling stressed out. Your cortisol goes up, glucose is bouncing around in your bloodstream, it has nowhere to go. And so another thing that cortisol does is it stimulates fat uh, deposits, especially in your visceral region, in your middle, in the uh, belly region. And so let's think about this. If dieting is stressful and stress causes cortisol and cortisol causes weight gain, well maybe that's one reason why dieting doesn't work. And so what I did next was conduct a study where I randomly assign people to either diet or not diet, and then I looked at what happened to their cortisol. And so uh, to walk you through what happened, uh, people came in, we did cortisol sampling over a couple of days, that's sort of the gold standard way that we measure cortisol. Then I randomly assigned them to either diet or not diet, so 1,200 kilocalorie diet. Given that the average, average adult eats about 2,000 calories a day, you can get a sentence for. So it's not a very low calorie diet, it's a regular low calorie diet. And then I measured cortisol again. So what did I find? So here on the x-axis is before and after the diet. And on the y-axis is cortisol. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the control group in blue and the diet group in red. And what you can see here very simply is that the cortisol, I'm sorry, the dieting group increased in cortisol as I hypothesized. So dieting is considered a stressor by your body. And that cortisol could in turn lead to weight gain. And so now we have you know, one clue as to why dieting doesn't seem to work over the long term. So I'm trying to build a case here that low calorie dieting ultimately leads to weight gain. So, you know, a three week diet in that case uh, led to increases in the stress hormone cortisol. But next I wanna build a case for this link here, stress to weight gain. Is it true that stress causes you to gain weight over the long term? And so this I looked at in a remarkable study called the NHLBI Growth and Health Study, NGHS. Why is this study so amazing? Well, they got half black, half white girls, almost 2,400 girls across the United States. And they got them at age 10 and measured them once a year, every year for 10 measurement points until they hit age 19. And so it's really sort of precious longitudinal data that we have on all sorts of things. Originally, this study was set up to look at weight uh, health disparities between black and white girls because one of the biggest health disparities in our nation today is in obesity rates between black and white adolescent females. And just in case you're interested, now that the, the girls have grown up, they're around third, age 32, 33, we've gone back in with a subset of them and are measuring all sorts of things, including uh, what's going on with their kids and things like that. But for the purposes of what, I, what I'm about to show you, stress was measured throughout this whole study period and so also was BMI. So the question here is, if stress goes up, then does your BMI go up too? And that's exactly what we found. So the girls who are more stressed increased more in their body mass index. Uh, just to give you a sense for what that means, the high stress girls gained on average 0.68 BMI units whereas the low stress girls gain 0.58 BMI units. It might not seem like a lot, but one BMI point to the next is actually a huge, pretty huge range. And so this is, this is telling me that stress is one important factor that we need to look at in terms of BMI gain. And the other thing I found is that the relationship between stress and BMI was stronger in black girls. So that means that for the same amount of stress that a person is experiencing, a black girl is going to experience a bigger BMI gain than a white girl. And so this was sort of getting at this question of why do health disparities develop? Well, it could be that the stress that people encounter means more, has a bigger effect uh, on your body depending on what racial ethnic group you're from. So, Stress predicts BMI gain. I think the question is how. I talked a little bit about cortisol, but I think there's another sort of obvious way that stress can lead to weight gain, and that is through comfort eating or stress eating. 
And so, did you know that we are not the only species to do comfort eating? Actually, rodents do it too, it's amazing. So, this is work by the, the wonderful Mary Dahlman at UCSF. And what she does is she takes rats, in this case, and ran, randomly assigns them to either eat comfort food or not, and then measures what happens to their biological stress systems. And so in these studies, rat comfort food is usually uh, Oreo cookies or uh, Crisco mixed with sugar. So <laughs> are people like, ooh, that sounds good, or ooh, that sounds gross? Um, and so what she does is she finds that uh, when these rats are exposed to eat comfort food, they uh, develop this little uh, fat pad on their belly, and in turn, they see lowered levels of biological stress. So lower levels of the rat version of cortisol, cord called corticosterone, uh, but also at every step of the way through that HPA axis that I showed you, they see dampened uh, physiological stress responses. So this is really remarkable. It means that the comfort eating that we're doing might actually work to comfort us. It's not just a random thing that we do, it serves a purpose. So that's in rats. We needed to know though, is it true in humans as well? So really in a sort of proof of concept study, uh, what we did was take a very highly stressed group of humans and measured what we would expect if there is this so-called chronic stress response network that we're seeing in the rats. If that's true in humans, then we should see a couple things. We should see that comfort eating is high. We should see that little belly fat pad that we see in the rats. And then we should see dampened levels of physiological stress. And you can measure that in a bunch of different ways. We measured it three different ways in this study. One is just like how much cortisol is your body spewing out. Um, another is a synthetic cortisol test, so we give you a pill that is synthetic cortisol. Uh, in a normally functioning body, your body should shut down its own production of cortisol because it's flooded with this synthetic cortisol. But if your HPA axis is going crazy, then you're not as good at uh, shutting down your, uh, your endogenous cortisol levels. And then we also looked at their cortisol responses to a laboratory stressor. Uh, and so this is called the Trier Social Stress Test. It's the gold standard lab stressor. It's very stressful. In it, you are asked to first give a five minute speech about your personal strengths and weaknesses. You have to do this in a panel of three judges who are, they're not frowning at you, but they're just looking back at you with a neutral face. Uh, and every so often they say stressful things like, you're spending too much time on your strengths, please move on to your weaknesses. Um, <laughs> and if that doesn't get you, then there's a five minute math portion where you start at a very high number, 3,267, and you have to subtract by 13s, down, 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 down. If you make a mistake, you have to start over, and every minute the, the researcher says, please go faster, please go faster. So it's very stressful. <laughs> uh, so, what did we find? Well, we found exactly what we thought we'd find. So in this high-stress women, they were doing a lot of comfort eating. We saw that uh, belly fat pad in them, and we actually saw lower levels of daily cortisol. We saw that they were much better at shutting down their own cortisol secretion when we gave them that fake cortisol. And we saw that uh, in response to the laboratory stressor, here's time on the x-axis, their cortisol was actually dampened. So the blue line is low stress folks. You see sort of a characteristic up and down that we always see when we do this lab stressor. And then you can see that the high stress women are showing sort of an attenuated uh, cortisol response. So it seems like in humans too, comfort eating might actually work to, com to dampen our physiological stress systems. So that's physiology. Next, we wanted to sort of tackle psychology. So I did this with my wonderful graduate student, Laura Finch. Uh, and this was back in that group of black and white girls, the, the National Growth and Health Study. And here's the take home message here. Here on the x-axis are the number of stressful events that these girls have experienced. 
And here on the y-axis is uh, how stressful they told us it felt to them, right? And so these are the non-comfort eaters. To them, when you, f when you experience a stressor, you feel stressed. It's sort of basically a one-to-one -one relationship. But if you're a comfort eater, there's not as strong of a link between the stre experiencing stressful events and how stressed you feel about it. So we're surmising from this, this is at least supportive of the fact that maybe comfort eating is helping to comfort us uh, psychologically as well as biologically. But those of you who are savvy in the audience will know correlation is not causation, right? So in order to really understand causation, you have to do a randomized controlled trial where you randomly assign people to comfort eat or not, and then see what happens to their stress levels. And so that's what Laura and I are doing right now. Uh, I don't have the results for this for you yet, but I'm going to tell you what we're doing because I think it's pretty neat. So the first thing that we're doing is randomly assigning people to comfort eat either before or after the stressor. And the reason why this is important is I think the way we normally do comfort eating is something bad happens and then we eat, right? Your boyfriend breaks up with you, so then you have a hot fudge sundae. But we know from theory and research in emotion regulation that actually it's much more effective if you can use strategies and coping before a negative event happens rather than trying to, after the fact, make yourself feel better. And so this was, is trying to test, like, maybe there's a more effective way we can do comfort eating if you know that you're going to have a test, for example, or if you know you're going into maybe a stressful conversation with your significant other. Maybe you could comfort eat beforehand. That's what we're testing. Uh, and then the other thing is people have really assumed that uh, comfort foods have to be high calorie, high sugar, high fat. So will you shout out some of your favorite comfort foods? Ice cream? Chocolate? Donuts, yeah. Cheetos, yeah, I'm, I'm also the salty kind. I love chips and dip. Coffee? Oh, yeah, so um, beverages as comfort foods. I have a whole other line of research I'm not gonna talk about today, but we're looking at alcohol versus food in terms of how they comfort you. Anyway. I think we've all assumed that comfort eating has to be done with unhealthy foods, but that needs to be tested. Even in the rats, we've done Oreos or Crisco mixed with sugar, but what if healthy foods also help function to comfort you? That would be pretty cool. Uh, and so that's what we're testing here. So we're randomly assigning people to eat before or after the stressor, and then we're randomly assigning people to eat either unhealthy or healthy food to see if it dampens both our physiological and psychological stress. And so these are the, fruit, the foods that they are allowed to choose from. We have all of these on deck in our lab all the time. Uh, and we have participants choose the food that would be most comforting to them. Yes. Yeah, and so we had a lot of, um, we talked a lot about this actually, and we talked a lot about what which food goes where, and you know, people are always like, oh, granola, but then granola, so I totally see that point. In our mind, we chose foods that a peer reviewer would not be able to argue with us, you know, that cucumbers are healthier than cupcakes for example, but that's a really good point. Um, some of you might be skeptical too, like this is never gonna work, <laughs> but we actually did a survey of UCLA undergraduates and they ranked apples as more comforting than apple pie, which I think of as the quintessential comfort food. So I think, you know, it could work, possibly could work. Uh, and so we are looking here at psychological variables, so how stressed do you feel, but also this concept of guilt. A lot of people might do comfort eating but then feel really guilty about it. Uh, so we want to make sure to capture that experience as well. Uh, we're going to look at how well they performed on these, the, this speech and math tasks, how much they worry or ruminate about it. And of course we're looking at cortisol, but we're also looking at the sympathetic nervous system. 
uh, since cortisol is just one of the ways that your body responds to stress with. There's also the sympathetic nervous system, so we're looking at that too. So hopefully those results will be out soon. Um, we're done collecting data, we just need to crunch the numbers. Okay. So, hopefully I've convinced you at least a little bit that dieting doesn't work and maybe stress is one reason why. And as I was doing all of this work on dieting, it really brought me next to the question of why do people diet in the first place? So this is a funny quote, dieting is easy, it's like riding a bike, and the bike is on fire, and the ground is on fire, and everything is on fire because you're in hell. So this is exactly what Maria was talking about. Dieting is just a yucky experience, no one likes doing it, so why do we do it? And the answer to me seemed very, very clear. It's that we have this incredible societal pressure to be thin. There's incredible levels of stigma against people who are perceived to be overweight or heavy. Uh, and it's really pervasive. Uh, researchers have called it the last acceptable form of stigma. So people will say things about pe heavier people that you would never in a million years say about women or different racial groups or uh, sexual minorities. It just seems to be a kind of sanctioned form of, of stigma. And we know from work in racism, sexism, homophobia, we know from that kind of literature that experiencing stigma is really stressful. And so again, you know, my antenna sort of pinged up like stress, okay, so, if weight stigma is stressful, what are the implications here? And we know that you don't really need to understand the specifics of this graph, just know that we've worked out now that of all the different kinds of stressors that you experience, so taking a test, jumping out of an airplane, uh, being uh, going through a divorce, for example, it's stressors that are social in nature and involve evaluation or judgment, those are the stressors that make your cortisol go up the highest. And so I thought, certainly weight stigma fits this bill of a social, social stressor that definitely involves judgment. And so I started thinking, okay, so weight stigma probably increases cortisol, and once again, cortisol increases weight gain. That's gonna make you at ever more risk for more weight stigma, and it's just a crazy vicious cycle. And so this is the model I developed called the cyclic obesity weight-based stigma model. It's kind of a mouthful, but I wanted it to say cobwebs. So <laughs> it's the cobwebs model. So I could say you get stuck in the cobwebs. Um, so again, you experience the stigma that, in that increases your stress, which increases your cortisol, and also increased eating through comfort eating and that causes you to gain weight, and then that makes you ever more vulnerable to increased experiences of stigma. And so it's a vicious cycle. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my next 15 minutes or so um, talking about the work that I've done to try and get some data to support each step of this model. So the first one is these three boxes. <clears throat> And this is with my uh, wonderful postdoc mentor, Alyssa Eppel, and my colleague, Jennifer Dobbenmeyer, both at UCSF. And so the first thing I wanted to show is, again, proof of concept. Is there any link between weight stigma and cortisol? And so we first started out by just doing a correlational study, looking at measures of weight stigma and measures of cortisol and seeing if there's any link between the two. And we did this in uh, 42 women in the San Francisco area, so it was sort of a wealthier, well-to-do sample, mostly white, um, 41 years on average, with a mean BMI in that so-called obese range. And then we measured weight stigma. And so for those of you who are researchers in the audience, there's unfortunately not like a perfect measure that captures everything about weight stigma. So we decided to look at it, looking at it in two ways. One is how many stigmatizing events do you experience? So losing a job because of your size, someone saying something rude or mean to you because of your size. 
And then we also wanted to sort of capture the psychological sort of experience of weight stigma. And so we did that using the conscious, stigma consciousness scale. An example is, I never worry that my behaviors will be viewed as stereotypical of the overweight. Uh, I don't love the phrasing of the overweight, um, but that's the validated measure, so there you go. We also measured cortisol in a bunch of different ways. And then I sort of wanted to go for the brass ring here because cortisol fluctuates up and down uh, every day. What I wanted to get at was sort of a longer term measure of harmfulness to your health. And so for that, we looked at a measure of oxidative stress. This is sort of a measure of the wear and tear on your body at a cellular level. And so what did I find? Was there any relationship between the two? Yes. In fact, experiencing events and having consciousness of weight stigma was strongly related to different indices of cortisol, so how much cortisol you wake up with in the morning, how much, uh, uh, how much your cortisol sort of, your HPA axis sort of is responsive to your um, environment, so do you respond to stressors with a lot of cortisol? Um, and incredibly, this oxidative stress. So it looks like we're seeing at least a correlation between experiencing weight stigma, consciousness of weight stigma, and long-term accelerated cellular aging in this sample. And I want to make an important point here, which is that this analysis takes into account objective body mass index. So it's not just that you have a higher BMI and therefore your body looks a little bit more unhealthy. It really doesn't matter whether you're at the low end, that's the uh, red line, or at the high end of the body mass index range, the relationship between stigma and cortisol looks pretty much the same. So it's not about what your actual BMI is, it's how you sort of perceive the social world as stigmatizing the size of your body, which I think is so fascinating uh, from a psychologist perspective and sort of works to argue against the people who just assume heavier bodies, unhealthier bodies. Okay, so that's correlation. Correlation is not causation, and so what I really needed to do was show that if you randomly assign people to experience weight stigma or not, you will see differences in cortisol. And so this is the, an experiment done by my two wonderful graduate students, Mary Himmelstein and Angela Incalingo, now Rodriguez. And we called this study the psychology of shopping. And the cover story here was that we want to know what happens to your hormone levels when you shop in big groups. And so we uh, recruited a sample of 110 undergraduate women who either perceive themselves as heavy or not. So remember the importance of perceiving uh, your body weight as heavy or not. And randomized them to experience weight stigma or not. And so, you know, we put so much thought into uh, what this weight stigma manipulation should look like. We wanted it to mirror what people might experience out there in the real world. At the same time, we didn't want to go overboard from an ethical perspective um, and uh, make the intervention too intense because that might lead to participant distress. I'm happy to report that nobody, uh, that everybody, nobody reported uh, high levels of distress after our debriefing. Um, so people are brought in, we're, we tell them this up-and-coming designer uh, who's a UCLA alumna donated the clothes for this study, it's going to be really fun. They walk by a room that has a bunch of clothes that looks like this, there's pop music blaring from the room, and we say, okay, before you can start the shopping study, we need to make sure that you're going to fit into the clothes. So we weigh them, and we measure them. And then we take them into a waiting room with a couch, and on the couch is sitting a very thin confederate. So a confederate is someone who's actually in cahoots with the study, but the participant doesn't know that. They think they're just another participant. And so the, the confederate is um, welcomed into the shopping study, and then we turn to our participant and we say, unfortunately, 
you know, our shape and size just aren't ideal for this style of clothing, and we really do want everyone to have fun and feel good. Plus, we want to return the clothing to the designer in good condition. Sometimes I get gasps. Sometimes I get people being like, this happens to me all the time. Um, so again, we really tried hard to make sure that this was ethical, but yet still potentially stressful. Um, and actually a reviewer commended us on this. They're like, this kind of study is so hard to do and somehow you managed to do it um, in an ethical way. Control conditions. So the control conditions are still rejected. They still don't get to shop, but we say it's because you signed up last and the study is full. And so of course we're looking at different cortisol levels. So what I'm gonna show you are the people, again, who perceive themselves as heavy because we didn't see any action in the people who didn't perceive themselves as heavy. Here on the x-axis is the control group. Here is the stigma group. And you can see that, and on the y-axis here is cortisol. So you can see that the control group, their cortisol went down, whereas the stigma group, their cortisol went up a tiny bit or it was maintained at a very high level. So they aren't recovering from this stressor as quickly. And so that study showed that stigma causes cortisol secretion. Uh, but that's, you know, one time in a lab, does that even matter? Are you, do we really see that weight stigma leads to long-term weight gain? And so that's the next thing I'm gonna talk to you about. And this is with my wonderful postdoc, Jeff Hunger. Yes, that is his last name. <laughs> Perfect for this kind of work. Um, this again is in that NHLBI growth and health study with the black and white girls. And what we looked at was at age 10, there's a measure of, if not sort of blatant weight stigma, at least weight labeling. So at age 10, these girls were asked, have any of these people told you you're too fat? Followed by lists that included father, mother, sister, brother, best girlfriend, boy you like best, um, and teacher. And so the question here was, if somebody is calling you too fat at age 10, what happens to your BMI over time? And so this is sort of small, but the take home message here is that uh, for every additional person who called you too fat, your chances of having a BMI over 30 at age 19 was 66% higher. Stated another way, for every additional family member who stigmatized or you or called you too fat, your BMI was half a BMI point higher at age 19, whereas if it was teacher, best girlfriend, boy you like best, it was uh, 0.2 BMI points higher. And this, of course, is controlling for baseline BMI. So it's not just that heavy girls end up being heavier. Uh, it's, it's net or independent of that. It's about increases in BMI for people who are calling you too fat in your social circle. And this is in line with nationally representative results in adults as well. So if you experience weight stigma, weight discrimination, your, your uh, future risk of weight gain is higher. And I think this really underscores a very insidious nature of weight stigma. So in other forms of socially stigmatized conditions, so uh, for example, um, being an ethnic minority. So for, for people, I'll use myself as an example. If someone slings a racial slur at me for being Asian, normally I would go to my mom and say, oh my gosh, can you believe that this happened to me? And she would be a huge source of social support. In the case of weight, though, it seems that across this study and many, many others, it's the people who are in our family, the people who are closest to us, who can often be the most stigmatizing. Uh, and so, so not only is it this pervasive stigma, but you're not, uh, you don't have access to these normal sources of support. And this is something we're seeing here. And this, is, this slide is not in the slide deck that was distributed because I just did these analyses this morning. But because of this audience, we have also data on eating disorder, thoughts, behaviors, and uh, cognitions in this data set. So I wanted to look at that data and found that, just as you might expect, people who are called too fat by these close others uh, had a 
a higher likelihood of engaging in unhealthy weight control behaviors. So fasting for longer than a day, vomiting, taking diet pills, and using laxatives. They also score higher on the eating disorders inventory, which is a questionnaire measure of eating disorder thoughts. Uh, and so, you know, this is not only not working to keep somebody's weight down if that's your goal, but it's also putting people at risk for eating disordered symptoms. And once again, I don't have it on the slide here, but it seems like the family is having a larger effect than others. So it's something that we can really use as a take home message that we need to be that source of support for people in our family. Okay, so it does seem like stigma longitudinally predicts weight gain. Some of you who are paying attention might have noticed, excuse me, you skipped over eating. And so this is what we're studying right now. Uh, we're looking at weight stigma and cortisol as it's lived out there in daily life. And so I'm about to show you a video of what it's like to be a participant in this study. But basically, we have people go out, we have this snazzy app that we developed. Um, it's not even an app, it's based on texting, thank you. Um, where we have people text us every time they experience weight stigma, and then we measure their cortisol, we ask about their eating. And so I'm gonna show you this little video. Yes. Welcome to the Omniscience Mobile System for Patient Engagement. This demo will show you how the OmniPro system will collect your responses via text message during the UCLA texting study. Once you start the study, you will text the keyword event to the number 87888 every time you experience weight stigma. That's when you're treated differently because of your weight or something or someone makes you feel bad because of your weight. As soon as you text event, you will receive a message prompting you to give a saliva sample using the clear tube from the materials we've provided. After giving the saliva sample, reply with the letter Y to continue. You will immediately receive a three-question survey asking about your stress levels, feelings of shame, and the situation that initially prompted you to text event. So I won't go through the whole video because of time, but you can see that by doing this study, we'll not only get to understand from a person's actual perspective what are the events that you're experiencing out there, but we can also look at what kind of events are triggering the highest cortisol response, what kind of events are triggering the highest amount of eating, to really get at the lived-in experience um, of people as they're experiencing weight stigma. And then finally, we're doing a longitudinal study to really test the whole model. So if you experience stigma, does that increase your stress over time? Does that increase your cortisol and eating? Does that increase your weight gain? And does that put you at ever more risk? for experiencing weight stigma. So that's a one year longitudinal study looking at all of these things and seeing is this really this vicious cycle sort of thing. And so today I hope I've convinced you that dieting doesn't work, giving you maybe some reasons for why it might not work and understand the sort of pervasive nature of this uh, stigma against heavier bodies that we have. Um, and if you have any questions or want to read more about any of my papers, uh, that's my website up there. And I want to thank you all so much.